sorry to keep you waiting. And it was really only, I, I think I emailed Lewis a month ago. Um, I uh, had the opportunity today at noon um, that the Allen Foundation and our project, the Salt City Market, was being honored by the Center State CEO Economic Champion Luncheon. So I just left there, hundred about a thousand people. Quite, quite a <laughs> remarkable gathering at the On Center to accept that quick award. And I literally accepted the award and walked out the door. So <laughs> I apologize, I, I felt so badly. But I also have some other colleagues that I do this work with, but I felt really committed to coming because I had said I was gonna come and I didn't want to just um, send one of my colleagues. So as you can see, the Allen Family Foundation, just a quick word. Um, we are a foundation that actually existed in 1954 um, and was founded by uh, W.G. Allen and his father, W.F. Allen. And they were the um, founders of the company Welch Allen, medical device company based first in Auburn, New York, and then Skinny Atlas Falls, and then Skinny Atlas. Um, the when the foundation was founded in 1954, it was really meant to be a way to support the employees that mostly live in that end of Onondaga County and Cayuga County in terms of supporting capital things that would improve the quality of life for a lot of the employees. So they, back then there were things like um, support of the development of a YMCA in Auburn, New York, um, the Cayuga Community College, anything that the employees were involved with, even things down to Boy Scouts. They provided camperships. They were very engaged in, in a lot of those activities. So I came on board after a long career in not-for-profit management in 2006. Um, at the time, the foundation had assets of about 20 million, 12 million, 12 million dollars. And as the way foundations traditionally operate in philanthropy is that you take these endowments, you invest them, and you steward them appropriately, and then as required by the IRS, you distribute 5% of them every year. So um, when you're you know, 10 million, uh, then you have to distribute 500,000 into the community. So that's essentially what we did. Um, I also, at the time, the company, well, Jalen was also operating and growing significantly in Skinny Atlas Falls and around the world, um, and I also oversaw all of the kind of corporate social responsibility, is what you call it, um, that tries to get employees involved. We were a strong um, United Way company, everything else that involved employee volunteer days, everything else on employee and stewardship. Um, I did leave that, as Lewis said, for uh, about a year and a half to become president of Onondaga Community College. Um, we've always had a very strong commitment to higher education. I had been a governor's appointment to that board, and we're very passionate about the mission, and, and still are, of Onondaga Community College. Um, so in 2015, interestingly enough, this, this family, of which, you know, in, in full disclosure, my husband is one of the fourth generation members of this family. It's easy, it's nice when you have different last names. I've always had it, you know, I always had my name when I got married. So I always get to find out things about this family that people will tell me before they realize that I'm actually married into this family for, we've been married for 32 years. So um, it's kind of fun. So we, um, the, in 2015, the company sold. It, it has been a family owned business for 100 years. As anyone who's had a family business, whether it's, I say, a pizzeria or you know a multi-million, billion dollar company, it's still very hard and complicated. There's a great saying that the family destroys the business or the business destroys the family. I would say that in this case, it was a little bit of a combination of probably both, plus economic conditions that were kind of forcing and changing the medical industry. So the company sold in 2015, and they had a foundation at the time, which was 32 million, um, and there was a lot of questions with the family how they were gonna do this. Um, and, and then, you know, it was also my husband had been chair of the board at the time that the company sold. So there was a lot of dynamics, as you would imagine, um, it, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated when you've been such a big presence, especially in a small town, similar to Manlius. Skinny House is even smaller, and that quadrant of Onondaga and Cayuga County, it's hard because a lot of employees didn't understand and didn't expect that this was going to happen. Um, so it reverberated out in a lot of ways, and there was a lot of questions about, you know, do you just kind of spend down the foundation? Um, there haven't been a lot of family members. My three daughters, for example, don't live here now in Central New York. They might come back, but a lot of the family members in the fourth and fifth generation did not, were not living in central New York. And so there were a lot of conversations and we had a good like three hour just really meeting to say what are we gonna do and what, what does this mean? And, and like I said, I've been working in and out of this field and lived, I'm a transplant to central New York. My husband and I met in college, um, but felt deeply committed that I love central New York. I mean, I, 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 there are many other parts and I've had the opportunity to live around the world, 
But I always come back and I there is something special about Central New York. It's about the people. It's about, I don't care. I like snow. I don't like heat. <laughs> you know, I love Central New York. And I, you know, I felt like this, we should stay here. But I didn't really want to stay here and didn't want to kind of continue to do this work in a whole new way without the foundation having the ability to operate and think and, and, and do something different. And so that is essentially what we did. We took a $30 million operation, a $30 million foundation, and have now built it to almost $100 million by family contributions. I should say that it's only two branches of this family. There was one branch that, because of all the dynamics with the sale, um, decided to kind of go their own path. Um, but um, what I love about this logo, it's kind of where I got back to, was this idea that this, found, this family foundation is about, I have a board that now is, it used to be community members and family members, it's now just family members, um, but it, it represents five generations. The majority of the board members now are my um, children. Um, that are, my, my three girls are over the age of 21, but they're cousins and other um, members of that fifth generation. And even if they don't live here, they have all contributed to the foundation. That was a, that was a condition upon continuing and being involved. And they're also deeply committed to thinking about this work differently. So, kind of gets us to, do you have a clicker or a, <laughs> can I just operate from here? Yes. Okay. Oh, maybe that's the clicker. So, um. Oh, my glasses? No, I think I can figure out how to do this. Um, I'm going to skip over that um, and go right to the Salt City Market. So um, in 2015, and over the process once the company sold, we had a really long conversation about what the future of this foundation would be. And there was a lot of discussion about, in a traditional philanthropic model, right, you have an organization who comes to you and says, I have a need and then a funder looks at all of it, you have committees that decide, and then you decide if you're gonna fund that project. Um, and I had been a real proponent, started in 2007, that I didn't like that, that grantee, grantor model. I get why it kind of works, I get why it's important, but I really feel strongly that family foundations especially, they can operate differently. They, they don't have to be so reactive. Why can't they be far more proactive? Why can't they take a lead to say, with the mayor and the county executive and key business leaders and community leaders. You know, we have an issue with poverty. How are we really gonna solve that? And you sit down at the table and it's not about you bring resources, but you also bring extensive knowledge about let's think about how to do this differently. Let's go talk to some of the neighbors. Let's, let's figure out how we wanna do something different. And when you have a board that only meets twice a year, and, and we do our annual meeting virtually um, at the end of the year, and you also have a lot of people who don't live here, you have to have that strategic approach. Because if I sat down with them and went over a list of requests and said, well, you know, let's give 20,000 to the Samaritan Center, let's give 10,000 to the Boys and Girls Club, they don't know those organizations, right? Because they don't really live here. But if I start to say, we're gonna work on homelessness, or long-term housing, or community development, or um, in the case of Salt City Market, really the opportunity to have um, jobs and entrepreneurs in opportunities that they don't have access to capital, they can kind of get that. So they improve the strategy, and then they have me and my staff that implement the strategy, which came to the Salt City Market. So the Salt City Market is a combination of the Allen Foundation, and as a foundation, we, like I said, the traditional thing is you give out 5% in grants. We instead created a new 501c3 operating organization called the Syracuse Urban Partnership. And technically, the Syracuse Urban Partnership is the entity that bought the 1.6 acre lot of land on the corner of Salina and West Onondaga. It's the entity that is building the building on the, on the lot and then will also always operate and manage it. And that has a community board. That has a board of directors that's comprised of 12 folks, um, of which the Allen Foundation, I chair that board, and the Allen Foundation has three seats on that board. So it is its own standalone 501c3, and they are now developing what is known as the Salt City Market. So what is our vision for this market? We look at it as an intentional investment in our city, to foster opportunity in support of a vibrant, prosperous, and inclusive community for all. What we look at as our vision is to connect diverse cultures and people in a welcoming and inclusive gathering space. 
The Salt City Market is going to provide the space and support for individuals to create generational wealth through the sharing of food and culture. Um, the intentional part of this was really <coughs> important. Um, the way that we structured this, as I said, is a not-for-profit. Um, the Syracuse Urban Partnership is the standalone entity. The relationship to the Allen Foundation is that the Allen Foundation is using of that hundred million dollars. In the foundation world, you talk about the five percent, but really, what else are you doing with that other 95%, right? That, that's where, you know, we have a lot of money sitting essentially in a, in a bank, think of it. How else are you using that for community good? So in the past, we have what we call mission-related investing. It's like ESG. We also um, were really instrumental in funding early on something called the Cuba Venture Fund, and now also Armory Square Ventures, because we believe strongly that if we can put some of our assets into local venture funds, what will, will support economic development, that's important for the growth of the region. Um, we've also done things like loan guarantees. You know, Loretta, for example, needed on its balance sheet to borrow some money. We back loans. We've done that for a long time with a partner home headquarters in Syracuse for first time home buyers. So all different ways to use our assets instead of just having them sit somewhere. So that's the other example of this. The Allen Foundation, through a line of credit, has a $25 million that it is using to build this project, of which then, when the project is completed, the Salt City Market will then, and the Syracuse Urban Partnership, will pay it back over time to the Allen Family Foundation. We did a lot of analysis before we chose this lot. So um, I think many of you probably know where it is. If you're from downtown Syracuse, you can see right here is the Hotel Syracuse, right? We've also been very involved in the Red House, um, project, which is in the old Sibley's building right here. Days is here. The galleries are right here. Um, and most notably, this is the rescue mission, right? There is um, a, has been for a long time, along this Clinton Street right here, significant number of drug deals. It's a, it's a problem corner, I would say, which is for many years why it was never developed. Um, it used to hope, it used to actually, we did um, the historical, a society did a whole analysis for us. It was a hotel. It was the Maori Hotel. And right next to the Maori Hotel was the Curry Cafe. In 1957, the hotel <coughs> burned. Um, and then they imploded the hotel, filled it in, and it became um, an urban renewal site, essentially. Um, but what we like about this is it's a corner of downtown that has not and is not really undergoing as much renovation and development as the rest. If you go down to the Clinton Street or Hanover Square, that area of downtown Syracuse has seen tremendous growth, especially with the completion of the State Tower renovation. This end of downtown, other than the Hotel Syracuse, they did put the bus hub right there, is still struggling. Um, if we can get the county executives um, and the city's partnership for the old Central Tech to put in the same <coughs> school, that will continue to build on the revitalization down in this neighborhood there. So what is this building, which I'm going to show you? It's a market food hall, 24,000 square feet on the first floor, and then three floors of essentially 13,500 feet. One floor is office space, and two floors of mixed income housing, 26 units. Um, why this is also transformational and very different than what you see downtown? I mean, there's a lot of not-for-profit office space. That's kind of a small part of this. But the mixed income housing is really important. I think as many of you might have heard or if you've ever gone on the downtown living tours, um, there has been a huge resurgence in wanting to live downtown, both for young people, but also empty nesters who are coming down. Um, and you have phenomenal apartments, and you have apartments that are starting at $1,800 a month for a one bedroom apartment. I mean, that's a lot of money. I mean, the State Tower, the penthouse at the State Tower, um, I'm not going to tell you who lives there, but I, but I know them well. They pay $5,000 a month. I mean, that's like New York City prices. Who would think that that kind could be generated um, for rental income in downtown Syracuse? What it has done, though, is pushed out, especially young professionals that can't afford to live downtown, even though they might work downtown. They might work at TCG Player or Skin Car, Spin Car, Cherokee, or you know, Upstate. They can't afford to live downtown if you're making a salary of $40,000. And they're living out, especially areas like Clay, Camillus, Garden Apartments. But the economic vitality of the city needs more and more of those millennials to be able to live downtown. And millennials want to live with people that are really diverse. Not just diverse 
economically, but diverse in all sense of the word. And that includes, you know, just socioeconomically. So that's why mixed income housing is all over most of the other major cities across the United States. And it's been hard for Syracuse to make it happen. Partly that's because for developers, they want as great a return as they can get on their apartments and their development. And so if they can get a 20% ROI, why don't they keep just doing those high-end rentals? So it will come to a saturation point, but until then, that was an important part of this project. So this is what our building's gonna look like. So um, you can see this building right here is the old um, uh, Goldberg's warehouse. It's being done by the Goodfellows developing. That's almost completed. Um, so this is kind of looking almost from the Hotel Syracuse across at our building. So like I said, this is the 24,000 square feet, first floor. The ceilings are 22 feet high. We did a tremendous amount of community engagement and analysis, and what we heard loud and clear from people in the community was, make it so that it's on this corner, right? Make it so it looks like a beacon, like it shines out light. Don't make it with brick. We have too much brick downtown. Um, make it so that it feels warm and inviting, but also something that is forward thinking, that is really about the Syracuse of the future and not the Syracuse of the past. So this is that 24,000, and then this is the floor of office, and then the two floors of apartments. So again, that's the view if you were from, kind of the, the looking from the Marriott. Um, this is the view if you're kind of just on Salina Street looking at Hyatt Place. So that's kind of the side view of it. Oops, where's the back? Oh, I guess there's not a back view. So what is in this first floor? When I talk about this 24,000 square feet, there's a few things. The first is that it is a marketplace. Eight food stalls of varying sizes with a rotation of vendors and the offering. Um, of those eight vendors, so don't think about, um, they're, um, we, we've, we spent about four years studying this model, right? It had been a concept in Syracuse that had been developed. It was gonna be the world food market. We were a finalist for the Bloomberg Philanthropies four years ago. Um, and the concept at that time was very similar, that we have so many entrepreneurs in Syracuse, especially ethnic entrepreneurs, new Americans, who, have, who really want to be able to cook, want to be able to, um, to, to have different food offerings, and we have especially a community that, that looks for that. We like Vietnamese food and Ethiopian food, and we want some diverse food. So how could we create a way that other cities have done this? So if you have been to, the most famous one probably is the Reading Terminal down in Philadelphia. I don't know if anyone has been there. It was done 30 years ago by, it was, and that was done by their equivalent of a center state CEO. It was an economic development strategy that they did to revitalize a whole area of West Philly. Um, if you go to Detroit, um, we've studied, there's a Midtown Global, it was a big old Sears um, building that was also completely converted um, to also be kind of one of these upstart um, concepts. If you've gone to something like Italy in Boston or New York, very cool concept, that's probably, a, that's a different model, a little more higher end, it has a grocery store component, it has a butcher, it has like a fishmonger, a cheese seller, that's not what we're thinking. Um, these are independent stalls, prepared food that you would get food for. We're gonna also have two that have non-hooded food stalls. There, we've we've also did a lot of market analysis. We want people, there are people that want a juice bar, there are people that want um, a baker. They don't necessarily need their little stands to have hoods and everything for cooking. We also um, are really pleased that one end of the market will have a coffee shop and bar. We're partnering with Salt City Coffee um, Aaron and his wife have an, uh, one Salt City Coffee down on West Onondaga Street. This would be their second location. They'll do coffee in the morning, and then in the evenings they'll convert to um, beer, wine, and a bar. So they will hold the liquor license for the entire market. So you can get food at one of the stalls, but then you can go and get your beer and then sit down in a place. Uh, we also were proud to announce two weeks ago, or maybe it was a week ago, that we have a downtown grocer. This is something that downtown has wanted for a long, long time. Um, and we're really partnered, it took us for a long time, but really happy that the Syracuse Co-op is gonna come in as the downtown grocer. We also will have a community kitchen. Um, a community kitchen is a place where not only, it's probably um, maybe this size room and a little bit wider, 
um, where it's a commercial kitchen. We can do food classes and demonstrations. Our vision would be, for example, kids go to the most for a field trip and then they go to the market. They come into this place. We might have one of our chefs from the food stands you know, talking about how, how you make a grain bowl or, or something like that. It would also be available to rent out. Um, you know, bachelorette parties are big, things like that. So it would be a private space. And then we also have space at the end of this as a big large community room. We heard everything from events to yoga classes to um, celebrations. That's also kind of built into that first floor concept. So this gives you a picture of what the inside would look like. So again, the ceilings, um, 22 feet, we're trying to bring them down. We're also really conscious, partly because my husband is deaf in one ear, these spaces can be really loud, right? So what you see, um, not only are these cool features because they look like a salt shaker, right? But they're also, they're also meant to muffle the sound in the space, right? A lot of these can be so loud. What you also see in here is this is the idea. Each of these vendors, so each of these eight vendors and then the two pop up, each of the 10 vendors um, are, think of them as independent entrepreneurs. Each of them, we set them up, we give them a lot of technical support, legal advice to set up, a, but they have a lease with us that's very minimal, but they actually have to, they have to borrow. They have to take out some money to start up their operations. Um, and they will also be able to, with us, design their signage. We work on what their menu is gonna be like. Like we don't want everybody to have the same menu. We need to diversify. So you come in and you're looking for one thing, that there's something in each of them. So this gives you kind of a feel of what the inside of the market will look like. Um, we've been working with a company called iCrave out of Brooklyn. They've been our consultants throughout this whole process. In addition to VIP Structures as the architect, as well as Snow Krylek, another architectural firm out of Minneapolis. So they have worked us, and they've done a lot of these. They're just finishing up in New York City if you get down to um, the Hudson Food Hall. They're just finishing that work. So there's been a lot of conversation about, well, how do you determine who, who are these merchants, right? What is our food hall process? Who's ideal for this food hall? Um, and one of our first priorities is really communities of color and immigrant communities. We feel like there's such a valuable untapped resource in Syracuse. And partly it's because they might have, they, they're great chefs, but the ability to start a restaurant and have the capital and take the risk is very difficult from anyone that just doesn't have kind of a, um, a family support network or someone to help them even borrow the capital to do what we do. So they're really important of who our market is. We've done a tremendous amount of outreach. We've had flyers that are done in eight languages. We work a lot with partners like the Center for New Americans through Interfaith Works, Catholic Charities, um, RISE, all sorts of organizations. And then we started to have applications and interviews. When we first put this out, in the first round, we had 82 individuals apply for an interview. So clearly, there is a demand, there's an excitement. This gives you a picture. We took from those 82 through a number of interviews. We narrowed it down to these 10 folks. And what I love is each one of these folks have a phenomenal story. I don't know if I want to call out one of them. Um, Dreamer has lived on the South Side for a long time. She has a business called Miss Prissy's. She's a caterer. She's been around for a long time. She's also a former rescue mission. She lived at the rescue mission for almost a year, right? And she will tell you about that and some of her challenges and issues. Um, this is Gloria Latoya, phenomenal from Puerto Rico. Um, um, it's a mother-daughter, right? And uh, the, the daughter is a full-time nurse up at St. Joe's. Um, and she is so excited, even, you know, she's, she's killing herself, cooking and nursing at the same time. She's phenomenal in terms of her energy, right? Everyone. Um, now here, she was um, one of the Cambodian refugees, six months, at uh, six months old, she and her father and her mother left um, on a boat and were lucky to even get out. She then um, was raised actually in Omaha. She came to Syracuse University as a student. Um, and I love the story. She came to Syracuse University, fell in love, ended up staying in Syracuse. She's married to a Post Standard writer. Um, and she's been working for the Post Standard on and off for a long, long time. Heard about this market, was so excited. But her parents, who are older, actually came this summer um, because they couldn't believe that she would, that this market was real. And they couldn't, they thought this was a step back for her. They said, how could you do this? We left, we left that country so you could have a better, better life. And now you're gonna go cook in a market? You think that that's better? So it was really interesting to see. And like I said, every single person has this phenomenal story. And it's these great people. 
So this was our first cohort of 10. Of the 10, five of them will move on to the market. And we had opportunities for them. This is another picture again with all the examples of who the 10 are. Then we, as part of all of this, we're not just telling people to set up, to set up and start their own business. We do all of this TR for them. We get them certification in, in health delivery, I mean, um, food service and safety. We help them with startup. We will have centralized, like no matter which vendor you go to, the point of sale will be the same. So they'll all have the same kind of, like how you swipe your credit card or how you pay. We also know that we have to do a centralized delivery. So whether it's Grubhub or Uber Eats, we will also do that for all of them. So there's some things that we do and some things they have to do individually. So what we started to do throughout the spring and summer was actually have these takeout Fridays, have opportunities for these vendors to cook for people and sell them, which gave people and everyone who came, and if anyone was able to come, you could then also um, rate which ones you liked or didn't like and what you thought was good. This is our second cohort right now. This is our next group that's coming through. Um, I love, there's a story behind each one of these folks as well. I guess this is one of my, Tommy's been around for a while. He's got a, um, um, his, a again, a, a lot of these have been kind of underground caterers for a long time. Um, the north side, the near west side, the south side. Um, Buddy Love, they've been also a caterer. They do some great, specifically salads, which are phenomenal. I love this guy especially, Grill Slayer, so I goes by. He, um, he is a, he's been a, he's been a chef in a few different places. He's a chef at the Marriott, actually, right downtown. He saw the wrapping. I think what happened was a lot of times people saw and heard about this project and we put a fence around it, we wrapped the site, and then he's like, wow, this is really gonna happen. And he walked in, he called us. And he is by far one of the most phenomenal chefs. He's just great. Um, so we're really excited. This cohort now will be doing some pop-up events um, you can also, you can like Salt City, if you're, if you're on Facebook, um, Salt City Market or our website, it tells you where you can pick up food on a Friday night um, and, and where it would be available. So I guess I will stop there um, and see if you have any questions. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the foundation will own the real estate? So technically the foundation doesn't. Technically this not-for-profit. And one of the reasons we did this not-for-profit Salt City um, market was because we didn't want the liability and exposure to the foundation, number one. And number two, we also wanted to, to drive other revenue to support it. So we've been really successful in leveraging um, uh, almost two and a half million dollars from the state through the regional economic development process. We've worked with National Grid. They've been a um, strong supporter, given us 250,000. Um, we've worked with um, the any, um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to support it through their Invest Health program. Um, so it's really important to us that it not be seen as the foundation. And that's also the family's kind of mantra. I mean, they tend to be pretty low key. And so I think that they didn't want their, their name is nowhere on this building. You would have no idea that they're kind of the ones that are, that are funding it and supporting it and incubating it. There will be a lending institution involved though. There will be so we are working with Cooperative and Pathfinder right now. They're the lending institution for our vendors. The lending institution for the foundation and the line of credit is J.K. Morgan um, Chase. Are you, and, are you, who's, who's, a, who's co-signing these loans? So the foundation is, yeah. I mean, that's basically what. You're able to leverage it through a line of credit because it's against the Allen Foundation's assets, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a good way to use our assets. And then we could make grants eventually to the Salt City market as well. I mean, well, that right. doesn't draw any money out of the foundation. Right. All you can do is catch your signature hanging in there right. until this thing pops. Right, until it pops. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good way to use. I mean, again, we're sitting on money, but how can you deploy it in more creative ways than just, I mean, it's great that we distribute about three and a half, four million dollars in grants, but how do you do it more creatively? Uh, so there won't be one entity operating the Salt City market as such. There'll be a number of different each of the, yeah, each of the businesses are their own entity, right? But it's all under the umbrella of the Syracuse <coughs> Urban Partnership. That's the not-for-profit. And they've hired like a market manager to oversee the market. We'll hire a property manager to oversee all the property and the vendors. Um, and we'll also hire someone who just kind of does marketing and events for us. I think you should speak about the Syracuse Cooperative over there on West Street, Kensington Place. 
The grocery store. The grocery store. Yeah. Okay. So, um, oh, they are, are they Jeremy is great. I don't know if anyone's had the opportunity. West Cop Street, a lot of communities have cooperative markets, right? They're member owned. Um, so the Syracuse Co-op has actually been around for a very long time. Um, and it right now has about 1,800 square feet. They have been looking to expand for a while um, and trying to figure out what their model was. And so um, we had started to talk to them three years ago about this concept. And at the time, they were interested in coming downtown, but they were also kind of interested in coming downtown in the same, in the same way that they're on Westcott Street. If you go to Westcott Street, a lot of it's organic, a lot of it's a little more high end. It's, it's for a clientele that, I don't want to say of Syracuse University, but a lot of that is geared toward that. We were asking them to come downtown and not just, you, you can't just have a $3 hat of lettuce. Like that's not gonna support some of the neighbors in the community there, right? That's, that's an extreme, but, but the <coughs> idea of that, right? You need to be able to have something that's more affordable and broader. And they kind of in their membership heard, heard it really loud and clear that there's a social mission to come down, it's serving both the south side, the near west side, right next to us. Not only is the rescue mission, but there's a high rise called Clinton Arms. That high rise is predominantly people, it's on Clinton Street, predominantly people that are all either um, older on SSI or disabled. And so they don't have a grocery store. I mean, and it's really hard. So this becomes their grocery store. So you've got somewhat of a catch free market to jump. Yes, yes, that's our hope. And you also have a little bit of a cap for market in that some of the vendors will likely also buy through the co-op. Like we're hoping, you know, that some of the vendors would also buy their groceries through them. Yeah. At first, uh, when I started to get involved the question. with this, I said, who would be the grocery store? Danny Wegman would say, oh, you can yes. buy it. <laughs> Feel around for something. No, and, and, and the developer, Bob Doucette, for years, when he took over the building on the corner of um, Salina and Jefferson, Right? It's where there's a Cafe Kubal right there on the corner. Um, he has apartments upstairs. He tried desperately to get this food hall concept and couldn't get a Trader Joe's, a Whole Food, a Wegmans on a smaller brand. Wegmans won't even do a smaller brand. No. But if you could get even a smaller marketplace, and Syracuse almost has the density of 5,000 people living downtown, which is where we're at, but you still have this, those types of really small kind of custom boutique Grocery stores, they're, they're great in New York City and really large metropolitan areas, but when you think about a second tier city, they're not in Rochester, they're not in Buffalo, they're not in Albany, that's just not their model. Saturday. Uh, what about parking? Yeah, yeah so I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't put a picture from the back. So because we are right on Salina and West Onondaga, the back side of this lot will have about 20 parking spots. So those are both, those are spots for the market, for the grocery store, you can park there. And then really across the street, and it's it, right behind it is what is, Onondaga County owns what they call the trolley lot. If you can think about it, it's almost behind the Armory Square. Most people access it behind the Sugarman Law Firm or that side of the city off of Armory. But there's a gate right there. So we've been working really closely with the county as a key partner to make that parking available as well. It's just so will that be limited parking? There's 200, there's 200 slots in it, so it'll be free. Okay. So our idea in the first year is we'll subsidize all the parking. If you come down, yeah. because we know this model works, so it's interesting. So we know that each of those vendors, all 10 of them, they need 100 people a day to come to them, yeah. right? So 100 people a day, you need 1,000 people to walk in and out and buy food out of this. We know how many people are working downtown. I mean, the galleries are full. Mm. Got Upstate has 300 people. Um, TCG Player has 250. I mean, we know how many people are downtown. We've studied the pattern. We know the price point for lunch. They want lunch between six and eight dollars. They, we know that the, all the folks that work in the courthouse building and the county office building, you have 45 minutes for lunch. You know, so we've studied all of that to know where we are. But we also know that especially in the evenings and on weekends, there's a downtown population, but we need people from the suburbs to come in and they need to feel safe to come downtown. So one of the other things that I didn't mention, which is great about this project, is we were, I was just in um, Troy, New York. Um, they have, right downtown, Troy, New York has gone through its own revitalization, and they have this beautiful old theater called the Proctor Theater. And right next to the Proctor Theater, literally behind the Proctor Theater, is their equivalent of the rescue mission. It's called the City Mission. And they partnered with the City Mission to create what they call an ambassador program. And the ambassador program is really about hospitality, safety, and support. Right, so this building, 
Um, our, our market, you know, there'll be a camera or two and we'll have a security guard. But what we also are excited to do is partner with the rescue mission. There are men that are in their crossroads program, they're very stable, um, that are also looking for, for jobs and opportunity. So for 12 or 15 hours a week, they will be trained. We have a 10 week training course that we're putting them through and they will wear salt city market jackets. They'll walk your groceries to the car, they'll be in the parking lot, they'll direct you. That whole idea of trying to get people so that they feel comfortable in that neighborhood, which a lot of people just haven't wanted to go down to before. Uh, with the parking situation, the employees will park. So the employees will park in that in the parking lot behind, mm -hmm. and the 26 apartments will have the opportunity to park in the Sibley's garage. So we've already worked out an arrangement with them because those are people who may or may not have a car. Right. But if they have a car, chances are they're not using it again. Mm -hmm. Our data has shown they're not using it during the week. They're walking to work. No. They just want it on the weekends when they're going out of town. So they want it where it's protected from the snow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, will the food co-op <coughs> floor space be something like the store they have in Constantine? Bigger. So bigger. yes, yes. More space they than have the bigger. Yeah, they have 1,800 square feet now, and they're having they're going to have 2,300 oh. square feet where we are. Yeah. And so they're very excited. They just not have any quality parking. You don't right. park in the front. Right. Which is why they really like this. There'll be dead. There'll be five dedicated spots just for the co-op. And they're still going to have the co-op. And they're still keeping the co-op. Yeah. <coughs> yep. And he wants to do another one. Yeah. And the food vendors. Yeah. Have eight prime ones. Yeah. Now. Do they rotate? If they do well, do they move out of there and you move in somebody else to boost them up? Right. So this is, that, that's kind of how you define success, right? Is our right. success, we've been really careful not to say that this is an incubator space. Because what we have seen in places across the country, and you might know too, you go to your favorite restaurant, it does really, really well, and then it moves to a new location, and suddenly it doesn't do well sometimes, right? It, for a lot of reasons. So we see this as both, both and. There will be some vendors who, after six months or a year, this is a starting point for them to go to their own brick and mortar. And we've worked with some businesses. Panchitos is a great example. We were really involved in Panchitos, if you get a chance. Um, it's a Mexican restaurant, family owned. They had one operation on the valley. Um, and now they're on the corner of Geddes and West Fayette. Um, we worked with home headquarters, bought a building, put them into there. So the idea would be some of these vendors might be ready to go into their own brick and mortar. They might do really well. But for some of them, if they can support their family and they're doing well, we're not going to force them to move out after a year or two. So that's, that's kind of an important part of the model. Yeah. Uh, construction and uh, market <coughs> opening timetable. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, it's just so funny when you, yes. when you, when you have good ideas and you still surround yourself with people who know what to do, it's still, a, it's always a challenge. So we did, um, as I mentioned before, we had, we did an RFP for architectural services, picked VIP, um, architects in partnership with iCrave and this other group, um, Snow Krylik. And then because VIP is design build, we also decided when we did our RFP for construction management services, we also selected them. So um, what we had hoped, it, it, and, and it has come true, I mean, it would help save us time because we would be designing at the same time that we would be thinking about construction. So we, um, if, you, if you're downtown right now, the, um, the many, I think there were six, six diggers there this morning, they are digging up all the oh. soil. They will finish the site work in the next two weeks. Um, there is some foundation from that old hotel that's there, which we're really excited about because we can use a little bit and build on some of that with the structural walls. Um, and so you will start to then see the cranes and all the steel going up. And they are on a deadline by contract to deliver the market to us by November 1st, 2020. So they will be done. A year from now. A year from now. Yeah. So yeah. if you have to go down and get our basketball suit up right there. That right there? It'll be all ready for you. Yeah. <laughs> As you pointed out, the uh, apartments that have been going up recently are pretty much high end and they are attracting either young professionals or empty nesters. Is there any effort to bring families into the apartments that uh, will be part of this uh, project? So it's going to be interesting. 18, um, eight of the apartments, eight of the 26, um, will be two bedroom. And we have had some inquiry. The other thing is that, so of the 28, there will be probably about eight that will be considered market rate. So they'll be the highest price point, which we could get 14 or $1,600 
per month for a one bedroom. And then um, the other, other 20 of those, of the other 20, between eight and 10 will actually be low, low income. They will be section eight designated apartments. So there are some folks who have been on the Section 8 list for a long time that are very excited. I mean, this is a really beautiful apartment. When you think about the, the, I mean, I think we have a crisis in affordable housing and the conditions that some families are in. So we have been working with the Syracuse Housing Authority and there have been conversations if we'll have families live there. Um, and what we have pretty much said is maybe if it was a single mother with one young child, maybe even coming out of the Salvation Army program, um, but it's really hard. That part of downtown, there's not a lot of grass. There's not a lot of, you know, there's not even a, you can walk over to De um, Seymour or Delaware School. But again, it's a few blocks over. You know, downtown is not as really family friendly as other cities would be. And I think it's because we still have neighborhoods. You could go like three blocks over and be in a home environment, have a lawn, be close to a park, which we really don't have. But that said, this Clinton Arms building right there on South Clinton, there's numerous children now living in there, mostly with grandparents. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that we're, we're kind of unsure how that's gonna play out. Is that the building you're talking about that's <coughs> up to the railroad? Uh, yes, right, yeah, yeah, it goes right up into the, the rail line. Yeah, sort of two questions. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you could finish talking about the apartments and tell us about that middle group that um, so the 12 apartments, so in Syracuse University, uh, so th this whole project is a not-for-profit. It's all a 501c3. So when we went to the IRS to justify why this is an apartment, why this should all be a not-for-profit, the, the number one question they had was around the apartments. What does, what does they call it, the charitability of housing look like when you have market rate and low, low income? And so what we had to document to them was that, like I said, out of the 28, eight could be market rate, but the other 20 had to be low income. And of that, you had to have a certain number that were low, low. So the low income in the city of Syracuse, if you make under $48,000 a year for the city, you qualify and are considered eligible for affordable housing. So a lot of times what we perceive that as professionals that might just be working downtown, we know that our community and downtown um, has a number of 23 to 34 year olds that might be working for not-for-profits, they might be working for the county, that make 35,000, maybe even $40,000 a year, and that's a good salary, but you can't, you can't afford to live downtown, especially if you have student debt. So what will that look like in terms of? So in the price point, yeah. probably around anywhere between 750 and 850. Okay. And cohort two. Yeah. What are the plans? In other words. Yes. What else were you? So there are again a whole bunch of pop up Fridays over the next um, all of November. If you get a chance, um, at noon on Fridays, a place called Common Space downtown, and then also through Westcott Community Center on Friday nights. Um, they have what they call uh, the, these kind of pop up events. You can come and it's takeout, and you can take your meal for six dollars, and you can kind of try it out. And we did them all summer. We completely sold out all the time. We did them at Westcott Community Center. We did them on, on the Eat, um, Eat to Live Co-op on the south side. And it's just a great opportunity. They cook 300 meals. Um, we have a partnership with the Northside Collaboratory um, in the Old Assumption Church on the north side. We help them build out their commercial kitchen so our vendors can use that space. And it's all health department certified. And then they sell them. But they are not necessarily in line for spots. Yes, they are. They are. Yeah. So we. So what will happen is, as of January, and the good thing is, I haven't. I mean, I know all of these vendors. I meet them, but um, I would, I'm not a good foodie. Like I would not be someone to. Um, and so we have a whole team of um, community members who get to vote on the different vendors. So they and that committee consists of. Um, folks who, the, the one who runs, who will run the market and who he hired is a guy by the name of Adam, Adam Sudman. He um, was the um, kind of brains behind the With Love market on Salina, on um, North Salina Street that was the OCC incubator for six months. So we, um, he has a whole team of folks. You know, we have a few chefs, um, you know, the woman, Abigail, who ran Lofo, and the guy who owned, who runs Darwin. Is that Abigail Doyle? Yeah. So we have a whole bunch of people that are on that committee selecting the appropriate vendors. And it's not just by how good they can cook. It's also, what's their customer's experience? Do they have, we've already had that first cohort of 10. We had two people drop out. And interestingly enough, they dropped out because they just didn't have the stamina. 
I mean, I, I waitressed for years. Like, working in the restaurant industry is hard. I mean, these folks are gonna have to come every single day at 11 and stay until nine at night. Like, you have to be able to want to do that as your job. So you have five that are coming from the first, first cohort. cohort. Yep. Five will come from the second cohort. Yep. And then will you stop there for a while or will you have another cohort? So that's all we'll have for the market to open. But I should also say part of our vision for the Syracuse Urban Partnership, it is this building, but it's this building as kind of emblematic of all the work we have already been doing in the community. You know, um, we have done other um, kind of ventures for entrepreneurs to put them in restaurants. So there might be some who won't make it into our market for whatever reason, but we'll, kill, we'll still continue to provide support and counseling and advice. I mean, they just stop in our office all the time. They drop off food all the time. <laughs> so every time you're looking for good food, there's always food somewhere. And so we really want to continue to support some of these entrepreneurs. And some of them it's just you know, as you might imagine, I mean, there's some of these new Americans who the trauma that they have experienced, like that also is something that we're like, you're not ready now, but let's work on this for six months. Let's help you. And then maybe you could be ready. Yeah. For somebody that wasn't here today, can they just go on that website? Yeah. And find out a lot about what just... Everything that I pretty much said is on that website. Okay. Yeah. Pictures, ideas, okay. concepts. Yeah. I'm trying to picture those entrepreneurs having one central place for collecting money and tips and things. So, like yeah, it's not one central place. Oh. It's, 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 a, it's a point of sale system. They eat, essentially what happens is, um, and I think if you've ever gone into a kind of a startup restaurant sometimes, especially if they tend to be either new Americans or folks who don't have a lot of, you know, they could be great chefs, but they don't have IT right. stuff. And there's this great, great restaurant, for example, I love Habibi, Habiba's Ethiopian Kitchen. If you haven't gotten there on your side, Habiba is amazing, it's an amazing chef. But if you go in there, and I go back there in her back office area, and she's got like dollar bills all over the place. I mean, I'm like, oh, Habiba, you can't just keep your money in a box, right? You've gotta have, and that's, that's a big thing that we found. A lot of folks just don't have the ability to either invest in technology, they don't know it. So we are saying the point of sale means that there'll be those like, what everyone uses now, those little iPad type, um, I don't know if you call them iPads, but you know, that you can click on, you can still pay with cash, but everything will be more centralized just to kind of help, and that's just to help these entrepreneurs. They have to keep track of their inventory, how much we're spending, you know? Like, and what's selling it? Yeah, how much they're selling, right? So, and, and that's part of teaching them to how to run this as a business, and that's really important to us. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned the Red House, or the Sydney building, and yeah. the Red House is in there, and um, how is, and, and also that, that corner is kind of, it's facing towards the eastern half of the northeastern part of the city. Yeah. To the west and south, there's just sort of a, a zone around it that's not particularly friendly for pedestrians. Right. And it's not that friendly going down the line past the Sibley building. Right. Like that, that. right. How is this, two things, one, how is the Sibley building going to, because you both, you're associated with both, how is the Sibley building going to play into and support the, um, the new mm -hmm. South City market and its plans to have the, because it's, I guess it's going very slowly, filling the, the space there. So how are, how are you going to get that space going in a way that it um, supports the South City market and also, is there anything that, just because you're so involved, is there anything going on with um, Center State or with uh, the mayor's office or any of the other development agencies looking at the space around to the, to the west and south yeah. of that location in terms of housing development or, or parks, anything? anything. anything. No. Yeah, so, so the Sibley's building has been a challenge, right? I think I was involved, we spent maybe a year and a half trying to court Aspen Dental to come into that, which would have been huge. You know, three or four hundred people downtown and Aspen pulled out at the last minute. Um, Bankers Trust, who you just saw, is now going over to the Inner Harbor. They were someone who wanted to also come down, 300 jobs. That Sibley's building is huge. Red House only takes up about a third of it. And it's beautiful. I don't know if you've been in that space yet. It is just phenomenal. And they are hitting it out of the park. I mean, they have kids coming in that building every day after school. Their shows are doing phenomenally well. 
but you would never know from the outside of the rest of the facade. So, so far, um, they have gotten some money to do the facade work, about $7 million, and I think that they just kept waiting for this anchor tenant. And so I work really closely with Jeremy Thurston and from Hayner Hoyt, um, but we are really trying to get that done also by the spring. So that would help that end so it doesn't look, it's just, I mean, Sibley's was a huge building. So that's important to us. And then across the street from our building is where the Hyatt place was supposed to go. It's right next to the Days building. So the Days building, and then there was this Hyatt place right next to the Hotel Syracuse. And again, unfortunately, there has been some fighting between developers, um, and that has held that up. We thought we had it. And again, I spent a lot of time with Rob Simpson and Ben Walsh <laughs> trying to get that project on board as well. It was last two weeks ago, it was slated to be done, and it was moving forward. It was going to open in May for graduation for SU. But again, there's still issues. But we're very conscious of that. Um, the Chimes building, which is kind of across the street there, that's actually doing better, and they're renovating it floor for floor. And it's um, apartments. We need to back half of that whole hotel set. Yes. <laughs> yep. And then the other thing is just that quarter down West Island yeah. Avenue. We are continuing to help. Pathfinder Bank is putting a new branch in there. Oh, they are. Yeah. So we're continuing to try and help development along that quarter. But again, it's trying to spur all this. If the steam school goes through at Central Tech, which it yes, looks really crazy. close yeah. to happen, that would be huge to revitalize right there. The what school? What is it? So the Central Tech High School, yeah. um, it's been fake. Yeah. It got for about 20 years now. The school district owns it, and the school district has tried to figure out what to do with it. There were a lot of developers who were interested in just developing it, um, but the school district has held on to it, and they finally came to an agreement. It took almost a year and a half for a partnership between the Syracuse City School District and the suburban schools to create, think of it like a magnet school, and it's called, it's for STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. And it would really be the premier regional high school for all those kids. So it is a, it's about an $80 million renovation project. I went in there at one point, because OC, when I was at OCC actually, Onondaga Community College was gonna take it over. Um, and it's, it needs a tremendous amount of work. So the only way to make it work was essentially to come up with a model, because the Syracuse City School District and the county suburban schools wouldn't really have enough of their construction funds to do it. So actually, this is where the county, and, and I'm a huge fan, actually, of Ryan McMahon because of it, the county has stepped forward to put up almost $60 million um, to turn the school around. And, and they're sitting on a huge amount of, of also, they have a huge fund as well. So it's a great project. And what happened and what the delay has been is it required legislative action because in the um, educational field, if you, like even Manlius and Fayetteville, it's kind of interesting how you can have joint high schools. Um, school districts are, along, are, are deemed along very clear jurisdictional lines. <laughs> So this required New York State through legislative action that Pam Hunter put forward with Rachel May to allow this type of collaboration. And the governor approved it, but has to then approve also the allocation of using funds in a unique way. It's already been approved by the Department of Education, New York State Department of Education. Great. So where will they park? Is parking there? there is parking behind the old Central Tech. There's a, there's a little lot in the back there. Yep, and then there's also ITC right down the street. That high school, that will stay there because that's a very much a technology school for the high school, for the Syracuse City School District, so that will stay. And then um, the idea with this STEAM school, though, is not really that it would have like sports teams or anything like that, that it would more be, it has the most phenomenal um, theater. 2,000 feet, it's see it's beautiful, the old Lincoln, it's the old historic. Lincoln, Lincoln, the Lincoln, and the and the and I think yeah. some of the best acoustics. Yes, yes. yes. Alma mater. There, yeah, and that's why they wanted to save it. It has the most beautiful acoustics in the building. Yes. And, um, but all new seats in it, all new, I mean, everything that you can think of that needs to be renovated in there would require it. But that's why it hurts so well for a regional steam school. And well yeah. located, too. Yeah, very, yeah. very it, easy to access. The bus, the, the bus has a, the terminal a wedge shot away. Yeah. Uh, the Civic Center yeah. parking lot is a couple of blocks away. Yeah, it's a walk, very manageable. It's a walk. Not, yeah. not the world's worst water they can work out of buses or something like that. Yeah. That building has lingered 
Yeah. We literally lingered with nobody to come in and in. say, bang, we, this is what we're going to do. Let's well, they chopped up the gym and the auditorium terribly. Right. I've been through there. Yeah. Really? Yeah. They, yeah. they took that They're beautiful terrible. Lincoln auditorium and they screwed it around? Yeah, they did. Yeah. They did. You yeah. see the inside of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now actually, it, it's not that it's condemned, but you actually, they're not even letting people go through it. It's so hazardous. So, hazardous. so, oh, so when do you see this? How happening? When do, so if they, they have, if they could, again, timing is everything, right? They were hoping that the governor would have signed the document. And they were hoping at the state fair when the governor was here that he was going to announce it. That got delayed. And so I even heard as of next week if it could finally get signed, partly because the money is lined up. And they were, re they were initially trying to open in the fall of 2020. Now it's looking more like the fall of 2021. Yeah. But How could we, at this little small uh, speaker series, uh, expound in the South City when, once you get the thing? Well, up I mean, once we get the thing up and running, come and have a meeting in our building, right? Like, I would really love for you to come down. I mean, I've told you about it. Now come and see, like, you know, it really in action. We would love to host that, something like that, come support it. I can even print coupons for the first time you want to come down. And I'll you give you free whatever you want. Is there a you meeting know? room? Or there is. There's a meeting room. Well, yeah, a little bit bigger than this. Get us there. I, yes, the bus to get you down there. We do that all the time. You have somewhat of an idea. Yeah. A totally non cash little operation. Yeah, yeah. Has to go through each time. Yes. Okay, we can't even put up. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we would love to kind of do something like that. Partner it with an, you know, a show at the Red House, do something like that. Yes, yeah, come down, yes. So then, did you have a big groundbreaking? Like you said they're digging the dirt? Yeah, was there, a, there was a small kind of groundbreaking we did. We had, um, we kind of had the city and some of our partners there. We've, okay. we've tried to, um, have different, we've, we've tried to keep it, partly it was because it was kind of a demolition site. Um, we've also tried to, keep, we've tried to build awareness about what we're doing through all of the most social media and other things like that. Um, and also just kind of trying to resonate with the neighborhood. So, and, and what I also love is that, you know, we put up a fence probably in the middle around August 7th, because we started doing some more soils. We had done a lot of soil samples, but we were doing more work on the site. We put up a fence, and again, it was a suburban company that came and put up the fence, and they're like, "Why are you, why are you developing here? Like, this is this this is like you know, just a crappy neighborhood." Why are you doing this? And I go, "No, no, no, this is really going to be great. And this is really good. And look at all these opportunities for people." And they're like, "Oh, someone's going to knock down this fence in a week, right?" And then three days later, we wrapped the whole fence. If you get a chance, they had to take the wrapping because they moved the fence out. We're going out onto some of the sidewalk, but we wrapped the fence with great visuals, kind of some of the stuff that you've seen here. We have this great partnership called Black Cub Communications that do all of our communications. And again, the people who are rapping, they're like, why are you doing this? It's gonna get like, someone's gonna like, you know, they're gonna demolish it, they're gonna cut it up, they're gonna do everything. And you know, eight weeks later, it looked perfectly beautiful, right? And part of that is because you have buy-in from the neighborhood. There's a lot of excitement. People want this to happen. They know all these people who have been trying out. You know, they all, many of them live in these neighborhoods. They're so excited for this. All these little so, companies, these businesses. Yeah. Have you, is your team prepared to build them a business plan and a yeah. pro forma P &L and all yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, Everything from trying to support them in what they're going to cook, right? What people might want to buy, what the price point is, how to teach them to buy in bulk. One of the things that you see all the time happen with restaurants is they run out of garlic and then they have to run and go get garlic, right? You see sometimes in Wegmans, they're, they're paying a premium for that. Whereas if they just ordered better, then they could get it at the discount price from Russo Produce or whatever. So that's all of that we help them with. Yep. Okay. yep. So who's the team that is helping them? So who's that team helping with? So it's, it's this guy, Adam Sudman, who's the market manager who came from With Love. He has another colleague, um, Colin, I can't remember Colin's last name. It just seems like there's people around all the time. Um, and he also is someone who works with, um, on the um, mostly on the chef and food preparation side. Then we partner with Center State CEO. They have a program called Upstart that yeah. Kira Crawford, Andrea, Andy Obernesser, a whole bunch of folks who also work with the entrepreneurs. On the lending side, we have partnerships with Cooperative Federal and Pathfinder who come in and talk with us. We already have, from the city, we have $100,000 in a uh, low interest loan pool 
that we will use and make available to the entrepreneurs. So it's it's so many different partners. And we yeah. believe really strongly that that's why I think this has such broad based support. Because there's so many people vested in the success of it. Right? You know, if that and I think that that matters a lot in collaboratives. <coughs> Have you talked with Samara at the Red House about perhaps having these uh, food, <coughs> food vendors catering at the Red House? Yes. And we've talked a lot about that, actually, because they're doing idea. more and more. We've had two events that were private events that Red House was running mm -hmm. that we used two of our caterers. And it gives them an opportunity, again, to yeah. showcase whether they can cook for something. Yeah, yeah. And they're really open. And that's what's so great about the Red House is you can do that. Like a lot of the other venues, whether it's the Mo, you know, the Marriott or Sky Army, they already have their own chefs. You have to use their chefs. But trying to find other ways to get our food entrepreneurs opportunities yeah. to see. It's a great spot at the Red House. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 I may stay on the horse. Yes. I was going to say. Great. I hope you weren't taping this and then you were going to. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. But I have like two or three questions, so if I can hold the yeah. floor, I'll ask them one at a time. First yeah. of all, my wife and I have gone on the uh, downtown living tour for years. Yeah. I don't know if we've missed any. And the last time we were there, the building on the north side of it was mm -hmm. going to be connected to this market. Is so that So it's right? standalone. Oh, because that building, which was the old Goldbergs, we actually have a really nice, which we're, we have a courtyard area of about 22 feet, because there was a, if we built our building too close, the, the land wasn't a stable, and they were worried that it could uh, cause either the Empire Building or the old Goldbergs to shift. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, Next, you, yeah. you mentioned sort of like space, park spaces or whatever, and one of the things my wife and I have always remarked on is there's no like balcony or if we wanted to go live downtown, there wouldn't be, which is why yeah. I like what VIP is going to do with my old building. Yeah. Like yeah. Standard. They're going to put balconies on. Is there any thought of doing some things like that? So we thought balconies are really expensive. Yeah, that's They're right. They're really difficult with code. Uh, we had the fire. So it's interesting, having learned so much about the city of Syracuse, the most difficult, the most difficult part of the approval, the whole approval and zoning process was the fire department. You would not believe how much, how much cloud that fire department has to approve things. Yeah. Right. And so that was one of the things why balconies, their insurance risks, they're very hard to put into buildings. Final, I guess yeah. my final question, and then I'll relinquish the floor a little bit, yeah. is um, a few weeks ago I wrote about um, Phil Romano, and uh -huh. this sounds so familiar to what Phil has been doing down in Dallas, so I just wondered if yep. there's any collaboration, cooperation, or inspiration back and forth, or? There hasn't been per se, though I, though I know Phil, um, but so again, what they're doing is more like Hudson Yards in New York City, yeah. the Italy models, much more higher end. Okay. And they would be, it would be the equivalent of us building this and saying, okay, Dinosaur, you put, you put an outlet in here, Pascal's, you put an outlet. Like you're taking existing, for the most part, really strong folks who have already had restaurants or know that industry. And in big cities, it's so expensive to have real estate, it's easier to put them in those venues. So it's similar to what Phil's doing, but it doesn't have really kind of the underlying economic opportunity, <coughs> the idea of trying to make um, trying to make this inclusive economic development, which is such an intention of this. Like if we just wanted to do it to make money, we probably would put strong hearts in there and dinosaur and you know have a pizza place, a BCO or something like that. Gotcha. I see. One yeah. more question, or it's yeah. more an observation, and then I'll increase the flow. So I hired now almost 20 years ago. Oh, yes. a terrific person, and yeah. I, my wife and I went to taste her food at Westcott a few weeks ago. Yeah. We've done a couple of others, and if anybody has a chance to yeah. go to these Friday nights at the Westcott or Yeah, just check it out on here. It tells you where they're going to be. It's delicious, and it's just a family atmosphere, and you'll really enjoy it. Where is this family? At the Westcott Community, Community Center. Center. Yeah, and on, on another, place. Oh. another good place. And on Wednesday night at six, Wednesday before Thanksgiving, um, at six o'clock, Westcott, they're going to have a whole. We have two or three vendors that are trying out to be bakery type because we know we need some bakery goods. They're doing pies and bakery things, and you can show up and also buy great pies and bakery stuff for Thanksgiving holiday. Yeah, I should be careful, Stan, that I mentioned that. Yeah. She's just phenomenal. Like, but that's a great, you know, like you just know her. Like this, who would have yeah. thought that this is what? And she's just so. She's like, even if I don't get picked for the market, Meg, this woman now who um, was the story I had told you. Um, you know, if, even if I don't get picked for the market, just thank you for doing this. Like the excitement and the enthusiasm and that we're highlighting this tremendous, we just think we have such tremendous human capital and potential in Syracuse to be able to do it. 
Yeah. Um, it says some, it's on Westcott Street, right? Yes, the Westcott what Community Center. It's oh, actually okay. down at Yes. Okay. Yep, and they do the takeouts there. Okay. The Westcott Community Center is on the corner of Westcott Street and Euclid Avenue. Yeah. 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 Parking is Yep. Yes. Yes. It is. You have to park in the neighborhood or the church across the street. Or yep. bikes. Yeah. 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 So, one of our other projects that we have been involved with, I don't know if you got to see, is that there are now bikes in downtown Syracuse. Oh, um, it's a bike sharing program that came. We, oh, yeah. with the mayor, we waited a year because the bike, the bike company that we used, Gotcha Bikes, was really cool. They were starting to do um, bike kind of shared services mm -hmm. in, in more colder climates. So the bikes that are now on the road, which are so cool, you can't get a flat tire because they're all rubberized, I guess. Yeah. There's no chain. There's nothing that can rust on the whole bike. The chain is also, it's the coolest thing. If you get a chance downtown. And so these have, um, we partnered with Gotcha Bikes. We put up money to help make sure that the bikes were accessible to people in the neighborhoods. So we put up six um, places where the bikes every night are parked. One of them, for example, outside the, South, the Southwest Community Center because we wanted to make sure that people could also use it for transportation, not just SU students that are kind of tooling around. Um, and what's also great about it is that you have to, in the gotcha bikes, because they have e-assist, so e-assist means that when you're biking up, you always have to pedal, but if you're biking up a hill, a battery, yeah. it will kind of kick in a little bit for you. It also is good because it has to be charged and they take care of the bikes and charging them. But what's also great is that you, in order to operate them, because they're e-assist, you can't be a kid. Mm. So you actually have to use your driver's license and you have to go online to register for the bike sharing program. So it's not geared like other cities, it's not geared to, for tourists at all. It's geared really for, as transportation for people who live in the city and, who, and for people who want to use the bikes. So what we did though was, not everyone has a driver's license, um, and also <coughs> it charges you per minute that you use the bike or you can get a membership, I think, of $50 for the whole year to use the bikes. Um, we partnered with Cooperative Federal so that if you are someone who needs um, some just support economically to use them, they give you a card, and you can actually use a card that's $5 and use the bikes. And so we've been tracking this whole um, bike sharing system, and it's been phenomenal. <laughs> It's really, yeah, so really great. You see all the bikes and what if they're being used? Yes, yeah. so they're being used. We can track who's using them, how often they're using them, where they're going in the city. And it's, it's really interesting because the same company, um, um, the same company also does those scooters. If you go to a lot of cities now, you see these electric scooters, um, which we were really, I mean, there's been problems. There's been good things about the scooters and negative things about the scooters, right? They're being left over on sidewalks. They're just dumped and dropped places. We're not seeing that with the bikes at all. Um, and so we would like to, they have 250, I think almost 300 bikes now on the road, and we'd like to continue to build that up to 1,000 over the next kind of year. I the bikes getting dumped like scooters do in some cities. They don't because, in order for you to get stopped charging for the use of the bike, you have to put it back in the rack. Scooters, that's part of the problem with the scooters. They don't have racks, apparently. I mean, I've only, right, I've only seen them in some cities like Austin and stuff like that, and it's been problematic. So we've been really pleased so far. So right outside the market, there's going to be a huge bike rack yeah, for people to put them there. Is this point of sale IT yeah. whatever? geared to also do inventory and yes. all of this so they will be able to do this everything together if they eventually transition out yep your vendors can they use the same not necessarily yours but can they yep. use the same software yeah same it's a standard software that you would use in the restaurant business so that also they take with them Fabulous. Right, right. Mm. It's a great software solution, and you know, again, they come down in price and points and stuff like that. Okay. <coughs> Any other comments? Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I just want to say one last, one last note. If you get a chance, um, and whether it's me or one of my other colleagues, the other project that you should get to know a little bit more about you might have read in the paper, is this initiative called Blueprint 15. Um, it's, it's not tied to 80 
81, though the future of 81 and how it will impact the downtown Syracuse is critical. But this is an initiative also that I've been working on for three years in partnership with the city of Syracuse, the Syracuse Housing Authority, and an organization out of Atlanta called Purpose Built Communities. And it is all about the revitalization of this enormous acreage of 22 acres of land 78% of that is owned by the Syracuse Housing Authority. It's one of the reasons that Syracuse does have the highest rates of concentration of poverty. It's not because Detroit, God, Flint, I've been to a lot of other cities where, where poverty is much, much higher. The reason Syracuse has the concentration of poverty is because we still have some of the largest public housing projects in the country. So it's complicated, it's an interesting dynamic, but it's also really well worth knowing a little bit more about because I think it's really important. It's and you ran into Vince Love. On yes. Yeah, he's running, right? He's running. We just hired him. Syracuse School, school District. District. They're controllers. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so Sharon Owens and I oversee this. Um, Sharon Owens is the deputy mayor in the city. Worked for a long time on it. And if you ever get a chance, Vince would be great to give you an also an overview.